Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Inyash Brodsky. I'm Steven Zuber, and today we have a special guest from, uh, well, Inyash, want to introduce our guest. Yes, our guest is Andres Gomez Emilson. Uh, and Andres is with us today from the Qualia Research Institute. I apparently have a tradition of once a year I meet someone at Burning Man, and then I have to have them on as a guest because they're doing something really interesting. And this year it is Andres. So welcome to the show. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. Now, before we start, when I when I heard that you were at the Qualia Research Institute, I was very confused because in in my as far as i know qualia is the the an abstract concept right it's like the quality of what an experience feels like right um it, yeah yeah i mean like one way i i tend to define it is um yeah basically like the the raw raw uh way in which experience presents itself um even you know, like even before we we give it a name, or even before we we do something with the experience, just the the way in which it feels, like the the blueness of blue. And uh, I mean, I think like the first moment, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's kind of like when you were a kid, and maybe you wondered like, is the blue that I see the same blue that others see? So like that's like that quality would be the the quality of blue that you can't describe to others. Right. That's that's what I always heard, and I mean. After a while, I figured it wasn't worth thinking about too much. They're probably more or less the same blue, unless you're colorblind or something. But, like, it always seemed to me an abstract concept, like a, like a util or something. Like, not something that actually exists in the world. There's, you know, neurons firing in the brain, which which correspond to wavelengths sitting my retina. But there's not, like, there's no actual blueness in, in in the same way that there's no actual platonic form of a chair, right? Inyash, or or am I thinking qualia, about things completely wrong? Of what now? I said, Inyash, you're not designing the, you're not denying the existence of qualia, are you? You don't you I, have I, experiences, right? I am kind of <laughs> denying the existence as a like as I don't know. I apparently I have a misunderstanding of what qualia is because or, or I'm you not denying sure how... it as scientifically investigatable. Yeah, so that's why I was like, what am I misunderstanding here? What is, what, are you using qualia in a different way or am I wrong about something? <laughs> I mean, that's a, that is a great question. I mean, like the, the term qualia is definitely controversial in philosophy of mind and it's a, an incredibly confusing term. However, uh, I, I think it kind of like a, a qualia centric view of, of the world, um, in a sense that grounds meaning in a way that nothing else does. So. I mean, you, you can try to, in a sense, like ground, like meaning, like kind of like what, what is it that we're actually talking about when we talk about things? You can try to ground it in the outside world. Um, and in which case, mm -hmm. yes, you might be concerned about, hey, there's no, there's no actual, you know, like platonic chair anywhere. Like chairs don't, don't really exist. They, they are kind of like this aggregate, you know, they, they may be functionally uh, distinct, but they, they don't kind of like have an existence of their own. And if, if you kind of like start with that kind of ontology, then yes, like qualia will sound like an extraordinarily abstract and, and diffuse concept with no kind of like a ground truth. But you can also kind of like start from the complete opposite end and say, well, my experience is the one thing that I am certain exists and, and its properties present themselves. And they are the, in a sense, like the one thing that, that I know what it feels like. Uh, I, I don't know how, um, you may experience the world and I don't know how like a pig or maybe an AI might experience the world, but I certainly know what my visual field looks like and uh, what it feels like. And in, in a sense, like you can um, reconstruct what meaning uh, is uh, in terms of qualia, so, such that in a sense, um, whenever we talk about the external world is a roundabout way about <laughs> to talk about our, our inner experience. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like a different different paradigm for how to how to approach meaning, and is the one I, I tend to resonate with. So it's a it's a you're using it as a a way to measure meaning in in life. Right. So like, uh, what what do things uh, actually mean? So um, is there is there any, ever like any hope of referring to anything that isn't ultimately grounded in experience? I mean, like if. If we were to talk about like uh, you know like an abstract entity, but whose properties never never are experienced in any way, shape, or form, um, what is it really that we're talking about? On, on the other hand, if let's say um, you describe a, a, a play and and you say that hey, like I really like the the lighting, I really liked uh, how you know the sounds emphasize the the emotions of the characters. In a sense, you can 
make sense of what you're saying in terms of how the play affected your experience. So in a way, whenever we talk about something in as much as talking about it is meaningful, that's because it influences the quality of our experiences. I, I don't know if this, uh, this makes sense or, or resonates in any way. No, I think it does to me. I think what you're, if I'm not reading too much into this, that meaning comes from the experience of conscious things that there's, that it's not meaning like rocks don't have meaningful experiences because they don't have experiences at all. Um, maybe kind of the difference between like a, a Roomba and a house elf, you know, one just does things as a robot without any qualia at all. Whereas the house elf from Harry Potter, and I use that cause it's like a Roomba, um, <laughs> cleans your house while having experience of doing so and can have fun or, or not doing it. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And I mean, in, in, in a sense, like, uh, I, I am generally of the of the mindset that uh, if anything matters in the universe, it, it will come down to whether uh, the states of consciousness in in the universe um, are something that we find valuable or not. Uh, it, it seems kind of like hard hard to define like what it would be for something to even mean something if nobody experiences it or any anybody ha nobody has like an actual representation of it. Right. Hmm. I've always felt basically the same way that. It, it, without without conscious life, nothing has any value at all. Not because it is, you know, bad or anything. It just conscious beings are what give value to to the universe. That's right. Yes, and I mean uh, that's a uh, 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 yeah that, that's kind of like a um, consciousness focused uh, ethics. And uh, I mean it's definitely controversial, but <laughs> I would I would pretty solidly wait wait wait, wait. yeah it's controversial. <laughs> it, it actually it actually uh, is to some extent. Uh, there there is some people who who question it. I I do have uh, some friends, um, and I know of some philosophers who who would say things such as. Um, that if you imagine a universe that, you know, there's nobody in there, there's no sentient being in there, but there are like these incredible, beautiful crystals, uh, and worlds with, uh, you know, like magma fountains and like awesome, incredible things that they are, they're not sure that that, that that is valueless, um, even though nobody experiences it. W whereas to me, it's, it's crazy to think that they could, that, that it could, possibly yeah. have any value at all if there's like nobody there i mean to, the only yeah <laughs> the, the only reason the the thought experiment experiment has any value is because we're like thinking about how beautiful those crystals and magma flows are right right <laughs> if, if we weren't thinking about them they would have no value at all that's right yes it, it, it's almost kind of like the value of that world comes from the fact that um it makes us imagine pretty pictures <laughs> it's yeah not, not in from its intrinsic existence yeah i had i did not realize there were people that felt otherwise that seems like a very strange position to take. Stephen, are you, how, how do you feel about this? I don't think I've ever asked you. Uh, I, I think it's clear that I agree with you guys that, I mean, there's nothing, you know, if, if the universe is full of beautiful crystals and magma river rivers and whatever, it's like, that's only pretty imagery because it's pretty imagery for us to imagine. It might as well be a universe of just rocks. I think the only way that has any value whatsoever is if it's like our universe pre-life, right? Where uh, the universe churns enough to, to build some self-replicating molecules that eventually start caring about the universe. Um, I think it's not so much that people think that, at least in my understanding of this position, I don't think that it's that people think that this is super valuable or desirable, just that it's better than nothing. And I, I guess, it, to me, it's about tantamount to nothing, right? Yeah. Um, yep. if, if, if universe with no lights on might as well not exist, but... I guess if I had to pick between, you know, <laughs> creating universe with, you know, or I guess not creating universe and creating universe with just cool rocks, then I'd choose the second one. But uh, that's probably just my taste and has nothing to do with what actually matters. Yeah, you're just choosing that one because it would give you something to do to create a universe with rocks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so what do you do at the Quality Institute? I'm curious <laughs> about what what I I oh no I don't want to. Uh, take us off this, this derailment, but I, I, I want to, since we do have a limited amount of time, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really curious yeah. about what the Qualia, Institute, Qualia Research Institute does and what your role is there and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I think like the, the discussion we are having, it's a, it's a wonderful kind of like way of uh, um, kind of like uh, warming us up to, to actually what the Qualia Research, Research Institute is. And, and the, the reason is that, yes, I mean, if you have a Kind of like a, a consciousness-centric uh, theory of value and of meaning, um, 
and you take that to heart, uh, you come to the conclusion that, in, in a sense, the, the most um, effective way of actually improving the world would be to, to improve our experiences. Um, and uh, I mean, the, it's definitely the case that a lot of, uh, you know, like interventions in the world, um, either via charities or, you know, uh, even, even like in the profit uh, sector, that um, all of those uh, work to improve the world because they improve people's experiences. I mean, definitely not not having malaria. It's a it's it's a it's a big improvement <laughs> on on yeah. having it <laughs> in terms of uh, yeah. you know your, your experiences, the fact that you're likely to to continue to live and uh, yeah, just like not not sufferingly suffering needlessly. Um, mm -hmm. But then when when it comes to you know like trying to solve the problem um, in in a big scale, you will you will have to come to terms with the fact that, that there's a very big uh, part of suffering that it's fairly independent from the actual external environment and kind of the, the configuration of the world. Um, and uh, I think like there's maybe the best example for, for these uh, has to do with people who um, are genetically predisposed to, to be depressed or have a high levels of anxiety. I mean, we we know by now that there are specific genes that modulate things like uh, pain thresholds. Um, if you have uh, one of the variants uh, of the uh, NCN9A gene um, that basically um, reduces your pain threshold, uh, you end up having a very miserable existence where you are in pain all the time, but also you're in psychological distress all the time. Uh, on the other hand, there's also other variants of the gene where um, you you have a higher pain threshold, and people who, who have that variant uh, tend to be very uh, happy and successful in in the in the modern world at the very least. And and, huh. and then there's like people who have um, another variant that basically eliminates pain completely, and uh, and that is a a maladaptive uh, variant because people who who have it don't tend to have a very high uh, life expectancy because they. They, they, I mean, they bump into things and they get hurt all the time without realizing it. But it, it does seem to be the case that having a higher pain threshold, all else being equal, tends to um, drastically improve the quality of, of people's lives. And uh, it's, it's, um, it's things like that, that that suggest, in a sense, that um, uh, in a sense, like the bulk of suffering can be explained in, in terms of it being evolutionarily advantageous in the ancestral environment. Um, and also being to a large extent genetically determined, um, and and with with that kind of uh, insight, um, really trying to do in a sense like surgery into into our experiences to to improve them seem to be uh, a, a much more effective way of improving the world than just like changing our environment. Um, so yes, uh, that that's kind of like. So do you mean do you mean things like giving people I don't know soma or equivalent sort of drugs just to make them feel happier or what uh what does what does this sort of surgery entail right so well w one important thing um is to remain economically useful uh and, and also to remain in a sense <laughs> capable of reproducing and uh continuing to to pass on uh pro-social patterns into the world and um that in a sense like rules out any kind of intervention that's that just generates uh uniform happiness um Gotcha. Yeah, so we, we're we're not interested in in soma for for that reason, or or in a sense like a lot of kind of like recreational agents that you know can be used as proofs of concept for what kind of states of consciousness uh, we may have in the future. A lot of them like are, are not very promising. I mean, things such as uh, hard opioids um, or hard stimulants. Um, they don't have a very good uh, psychological effect on people. I mean, it, it, it makes them very dysfunctional in one way or another. Um, but uh, if you look at, for example, uh, states of consciousness like those uh, induced by uh, MDMA, you, you will realize that, hey, like this is a state of consciousness that is both more pleasant and also more pro-social. And uh, in a sense, it doesn't drastically disrupt your preference architecture. I mean, like there are some people, you know, who, who will take MDMA and just uh, lay on the couch and just do nothing. But for most people, it makes them very sociable and, and want to, in a sense, interact with the world and gives them this feeling that they love the world and the, the, the world loves them. And, um, and it's a, yeah, it, it's a drastic improvement, at least uh, relative to the quality of experience. And it doesn't come with 
kind of the 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 functional cost of, of just you know ha kind of like wireheading or just being a, a couch potato the rest of your life um so that's that's the sort of um states of consciousness that we we are very interested in figuring out how to uh, replicate in a healthy and sustainable way so that we can have them whenever we need them. The, I can attest from uh, personal experience, of course, I'm saying this uh, disclaimer that I've never tried drugs. I've, you know, if, I, if the FDA ever asks, I've never tried drugs. But if I had tried drugs, um, uh, MDMA definitely works like you described. But I think one thing that it doesn't do is make me want to go to go to work and sit at my desk, right? Um, so it's, it's disruptive to my preference order in that on a mild enough dose to actually enjoy it, but uh, I, I, what am I trying to say? I should have organized this thought. Um, it, it disrupts some of my preferences in that the idea of going to work for eight hours and earning enough money to keep the lights on doesn't sound super appealing. You just want to hang out and talk and be social and be connected with people, but it does violate some of your other preferences um, like that, you know, to stay you know, housed and clothed, right? Yes. Uh, but I guess what you're saying is that this isn't this isn't the end state you're trying to uh, to, to um, give people. This is an example of a kind of thing. This is closer to the bullseye than uh, something that makes you just. Um, I think orgasmium is the term that occasionally comes up in the, <laughs> in, in, the in the literature on this side. Um, so you're not just laying around in total bliss till you starve to death as a happy you know uh, blob, but you're you're able to have goals and interactions and stuff. Okay, I see what you're saying. I didn't mean to derail. I'm just trying to keep up. No, that's that's uh, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, yes, and uh, I mean, MDMA-like states of consciousness are just proofs of concept. Uh, definitely, you want to be able to modulate as well things such as, uh, you know, like the, the level of uh, motivation and uh, also very crucially is your time horizons. I mean, the, something that empirically MDMA does, does seem to do is that uh, it makes people feel that kind of like the their immediate uh, kind of like bubble of reality, like everything that's only within, you know, like a, a 10 feet around them. Um, it's kind of like the, the thing that is actually real um, and, and they treat it as such. So, so they may not be very concerned about, you know, when when they get retired or, you know, not being fired from from from, from one's job and uh, and so on. But but I think, yeah, the, all of those are uh, tweakable parameters. And uh, yes, the, this is just a proof of concept for now. Yeah, I like that a lot. I think that that defines exactly what I was looking for. That's a good proof of concept of saying, look, there are states of consciousness that are, are desirable, and it's this sort of kind of thing. Um, okay, I see. I, perfect. I just wanted to, to hit that beat for a second. Yes. So is the first step trying to figure out what these states are? Right. Like what they look like? Yes. Okay, let, let me say kind of a two, two kind of like very broad introductory aspects to the Qualia Research Institute. So, yeah, I mean, like the, the, the first aspect is basically what are kind of like the very broad things that we do and, and objectives. I mean, the, the very first one is foundational research on consciousness um, with a special emphasis on the pleasure pain axis to figure out basically what makes an experience positive or negative or, or mixed or, or neutral. The second thing that we do is uh, generate technology. Um, I mean, that, we de I mean, we definitely don't don't use anything illegal, but we are interested in inter interventions such as um, Michael Persinger's uh, The God Helmet, um, basically these sort of uh, electromagnetic pulses um, that can target brain areas and produce interesting states of consciousness um, in fairly fairly reliable ways. But, but yeah, we, we're very interested in, in consciousness technologies. And finally, uh, we're interested in community building. Uh, I, we think uh, th there really there really is a need for kind of like a broader community of people who are thinking in terms of, you know, paradise engineering uh, via transforming our consciousness in a in a reliable way um, and sustainable way with with technology. Now, in in the third first aspect, kind of like what is like the foundational you know foundational consciousness research. Um, there as well, I would see subdivided into three things. So the first one is define the state space of consciousness. I mean, that is basically mapping out what is the set of all possible experiences that, that exist. I mean, obviously, this is a insanely ambitious task, and I don't think we will be done in, <laughs> in thousands of years, but somebody has to start it. Um, I mean, there's like some projects that, that have uh, related interests, but I think like having like a, an ambitious goal 
uh, kind of like a wiki consciousness where we map out the entire state space is a is very good. It kind of like um, pushes a, us in the right direction. This wouldn't yeah, go ahead. wouldn't different. Oh, sorry. Wouldn't different people's uh, experiences of the same things be different though, and so lead to different different maps? Right. So the range of possible experiences that are accessible to a given human will definitely be a subset of the of the range of con conscious experiences that are possible in the in the abstract. So, um, and I mean that that kind of like gets uh, you, you can nest that in a sense by by then like looking at the range of experiences that a person sober can access versus the range of experiences that the same person on psychedelics can access and and so on and so forth. Um, what we're interested in is kind of like the broader state space of consciousness and. I mean, there, there's reason to to believe that at least like some simple experiences, and I mean, we can we could go into what I mean by by a simple experience, but there's like a lot of low information experiences that I suspect that basically many different people can experience it, and and it will be very very similar uh, across across people, um, even if you have like different brains. Um, as long as you can emulate that particular low information experience, it's going to be basically the same. Um, um, I don't know if that... Is that something like seeing the color red? Yeah, I mean, imagine like a, an experience could be um, one where your entire visual field is covered with red and all of your attention, or at least like 90% of your attention is focused on the quality of your visual field. So, yeah, like that's... I mean, that... That is like sufficiently simple that you don't get this combinatorial explosion where the unique features of your brain uh, kind of like show up and and then then okay yes uh, unique experiences that others are never be going to be able to have except you uh, will appear but um, and yeah I mean uh, the, this definitely gets complicated by the fact that people's brains are different I mean in in all sorts of ways I mean as as I mentioned like people's genes <laughs> whether they have the SCN9A gene will make their experience of pain very different, uh, let alone, I'm sure there's like very huge differences uh, in terms of like what kind of uh, smells are accessible to you and what kind of um, oh, the, yeah. the way in which emotions feel, uh, which is different from, from person to person and and definitely how you react to, to psychedelics. I mean, LSD is very unlikely to be the same drug from, from one person to, to another, just in terms of, I mean, just considering that something like LSD affects 20 different neurotransmitters, uh, uh, receptor types, and then people have different concentrations for the, those receptor types. And yes, so the same drug is probably very different for, for each individual um, and, and so on. So yeah, it's a, it's a huge combinatorial explosion of possible experiences. Do you have like a, qu a quick uh, reply to the, the philosophical skeptic who would say, oh, you can't know if my experience of red is like yours? I have one in mind, but I'm curious what your kind of reply would be. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> just to that, to that, to that. Oh, I mean, yeah, to that general philosophical opposition. I would just point out that you know, if I'm looking at a red, you know, a picture of a red square, and if you're looking at a picture of a red square, we're both seeing so many of the same things, and we're built on architecture that is so close to identical that it's almost like the burden of proof is on them to to demonstrate that it w that we should expect it to be radically different. <laughs> right. Well, uh, I think, um, that, I mean, that, that is a very, very deep subject. And I think like, I agree that, uh, given our genetic makeup and the similarity of our genes and, and brain architecture that yes, in, in a sense, the burden proof would be there, but there's also like pretty strong reasons to believe that some of our kind of like core sensory qualia do differ from one person to another. Um, let, let, let's take like the simple example of how cilantro is perceived, uh, by different people. And we find that, Ugh. yeah, <laughs> oh, so maybe you're, you're one of the unlucky ones. <laughs> so yeah, I believe it's, a, well, so, but, there's, but, there's about, but I would like, argue that Inyash is having so, a different experience than I am when we have cilantro. Um, so it's in that, in that sense, we can pinpoint the difference in our architecture that, that explains why he likes it, or I guess we can point to the cause of that difference because we know what gene he has or he doesn't have that I have or vice versa. Yes. Um, we don't know maybe yet how that's manifested exactly in the level of the brain, but uh, it's, I don't know. I feel like that's, that's a different kind of, of 
example than two people looking at a red square. Right. Well, here's another. I I, I agree. It's a it's a somewhat different, but um, he, here's the thing. Like, you could have different qualia um relative to a, a stimuli, uh, for one of several reasons. I mean, one of them is that the the receptor types are different. Uh, I mean, definitely people who are colorblind because they like uh they, they lack a particular uh color receptor like that's that's pretty clear like why their experience is different um and uh and for for a lot of people who are colorblind um arguably simply giving their eyes this additional uh photoreceptor would allow them to actually experience the the rest of the colors because they they have the the appropriate hardware <laughs> in the visual cortex to do so but then there are also people who are colorblind because the uh, neuronal channels between the retina and the visual cortex are damaged or they're different. But then there's also people who are colorblind because the areas in the visual cortex that, that represent color are damaged or, or, or might be different. And what I would say is that um, there's one kind of a kind of like one, one possibility, which is like the case where uh, it's called the inverted spectrum uh, thought experiment, which is that um, in a sense, like for you, uh, what, what maps to red, uh, actually in me maps to, to green. Um, and for you, what maps to blue for me maps to yellow and vice versa. Uh, and the prob the problem here is that basically the color wheel is, uh, simply, uh, rotated 180 degrees. And, and, and that's a very, very subtle, uh, difference and very hard to actually describe because the relationship between every color in terms of like the, the geometry of the space of possible colors uh, remains the same. I mean, basically this, right. this rotation um, prevents you from, from saying like, hey, like I, maybe your green is different than mine because I know that, you know, like yellow, yellowish green is more similar to yellow than it is to green. And, and you can make arguments like that, but if the color wheel is essentially just rotated 180 degrees, all of those relationships with, will stay the same. Um, yeah, but you could never prove that in any way or test it in any way, right? Uh, you, you can. Uh, here is a, 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 couple of, a couple of possibilities. I mean, like one of them is uh, we figure out what precise gene expression um, in, in uh, the neurons in the visual cortex that, I mean, it's basically called the, yeah, the color region in the, in the visual cortex. What, what is the precise gene expression in there that creates uh, the particular protein structures uh, with a secondary, tertiary, and quaternary protein um, protein uh, structure that leads to, let's say, phenomenal red. Um, in in that case, you you would be able, to, at least by basing on your first person experience, to say, hey, like I know that this particular protein structure is necessary for my experience of red, and and you don't have it. Um, more so if I inject it directly into your brain, uh, or in a sense, like I make your neurons express it, all of a sudden you, you gain these, these new qualia and, and you're able to talk about it and, and it's novel for you. I think like a scenario like that would be one with, which would provide, ex, you know, like extraordinary, um, evidence to, to show that a person wasn't able to, to experience red before. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's one case, uh, which has to do with basically finding the biochemical underpinnings of, of different qualia varieties. There's also the case of mind melding, uh, which is much more, even further into kind of the territory of science fiction. But, uh, I mean, just as we know, uh, there's like some twins, uh, the Hogan sisters that basically they share, um, a thalamic bridge, uh, they, they're conjoined twins and, um, the thalamus in their brains, um, basically is bridged together such that they essentially share kind of like an extended thalamus across two different brains and they're able to, to experience each other's, uh, qualia. Um, I mean, they, they're still too young for us to really understand what their experience feels like, but, but it seems like a thalamic bridge that basically unifies your experience and my experience so that we are in a sense, one entity with two brains, <laughs> then we would be able to, to actually compare like, Hey, like how is the, the neurons in your brain that represent color? How do they map? um, to the neurons in my brain that represent color. And are we experiencing, you know, like a, um, um, inverted spectrum scenario or not? And, and I think, yeah, I honestly suspect that if we do come to the point where we can do reversible thalamic bridges and mind melding, that we will have, we will have a, a bunch of surprises <laughs> that actually our experiences are probably more different than, than we suspect.
I'm having a hard time imagining that though, because we both see the same wavelength of light on a like on a flower, and even if their like experience of that color is different, the it would be you know stimulating the same neurons in my brain that are all stimulated by that color, right? By by that wavelength. Oh uh, right. Well, okay. So like here is how how it would actually play out. So imagine that our brains are connected via a thalamic bridge, um, and and also a kind of like. Take to heart the idea that what this does is is not in the sense that it just pro provides kind of like a you know telepathy communication channel between us. It's it's a, a much stronger change. It, it would be something like all of a sudden there is like one entity that has two visual fields, two sensory um, two, two uh, sensory fields related to the body um, and mm -hmm. olfaction and so on, but it's, it's still the same unified consciousness is like one one entity with two visual fields so how you could do this is basically um in a sense you have uh, my face looking at the flower and, and you have your face looking at the flower um the wav wavelengths of light are affecting uh four different eyes in a sense but those eyes are connected to two different visual cortex and then you would be able to basically look at these two visual fields at once and see how does the flower look in one of them and how does the flower look in the other one and do they look the same? So that's that's how, you, how it would happen. I mean, it, it would be crazy because it, would be, it wouldn't really be yeah, but me or you, but it would be this unified entity with both of our brains. They, they couldn't be all that different though because we both interact with the same world and we can you know talk about things and manipulate objects and understand each other. So. I mean, there's there's an outside world that binds us all together. Th that's right, but it could be. I mean, it could be a, a one of those differences, like the inverted spectrum scenario, where the blue for you is uh, is a yellow for me. So the flower looks blue in one visual field and and looks yellow in a different in the other visual field. Does that make sense? S sort of. Do you do you remember that uh, like blue or gold dress thing that went around a few years ago uh yes i i believe that's uh, i mean that's that's related that's related um but but yes i i, I know the phenomenon that that has more to do with um things such as like the the how the the actual retina processes the the information um and and presumably to some extent how your your brain decides um uh how it's inferring the environment i believe that like if if the light, uh, if your brain inferred that the the picture was taken in a high light condition, then it, it saw it in a particular color. If it inferred oh. that it was in a low light condition, it saw it in a different color. Um, so I think like what was different from one person to another in that visual illusion had to do with how the brain is making inferences about the context of that light, uh, of, of that dress, where, where the dress uh, picture was taken. But it, I mean, it, it, it is related and like, um, but the thing is, like, you could you could still have like an inverted spectrum scenario, and that and and that illusion wouldn't really give you much of an insight in, into it. Um, there there is a I mean, like one another kind of like important uh, fact about the world that kind of like ups my 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 suspicion that our experiences are like much more different than we believe is is the fact that synesthesia exists. Um, I mean, you you do have a whole bunch of people who. Um, represent auditory stimuli with a phenomenal color and and they can have mm -hmm. complex visual experiences based on sound um, I mean usually it's kind of like they, they actually do experience sound qualia like they they do experience how sound feels like to others and then that's appended with uh, additional in a sense like decoration it's kind of like a decorated <laughs> decorated sound experience but uh, but you could imagine synesthesia that is basically just uh, uh, based on replacement. That rather than having auditory um, uh, experiences that then get embellished with visual experience, that maybe they just experience the visual visual experience with no auditory experience, and that's how they represent sound. Um, and uh, I mean, like the the main question that comes from this is like, why are we not all synesthetic? And and our take on that is that, in a sense, we all are. <laughs> we are just a functional type of synesthetic. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like the, the mapping between sensory input to different qualia varieties uh, that most people have happens to be a, a mapping that is really uh, effective for information processing. Um, so it, like the reason why colors are used to represent uh, wavelengths of light 
it's not that it has to be that way, uh, but it's more that the organisms that, that do that uh, basically are better at representing informational features of the visual landscape. Uh, so basically using that kind of representation is selected for. But but yeah, I mean, I, I, I suspect you could probably rerun the evolutionary game from, from the start. And uh, it could very well be that by by the time you have a you know intelligent creatures like us, um, whenever they open their eyes, they have complex auditory experiences to represent the the visual landscape, and they they have like absolutely no visual qualia. That I think that's a, huh. that would be a possibility, and and that might might be the case as well in other species. I really enjoyed the um, the exploration there. That made me think of a. Uh, I guess I have a lot of thoughts. I'll try and be brief. Or I'll, I'll just chop a couple of them off, and I'll point out that the um, the auditory experience of visual phenomena was explored in the uh, Deadpool comics and cartoon series. Or not Deadpool, geez, everyone does that, including me. Daredevil. <laughs> um, so Daredevil ha can't see; he doesn't get auditory, or excuse me, visual stimuli, but he gets uh, auditory experience that's enough for him to kind of build a visual picture, kind of like a echolocation. And I like. That kind of struck a chord when you, or a, a good chord that resonated with me when you said that we are all kind of synesthesia patients, but we're having, you know, paraphrasing, we're having auditory experiences of auditory phenomena. Um, whereas with somebody with synesthesia, it's getting wires crossed, but, you know, it, it doesn't, that, I don't know, for some reason that, that hit me on a, on a fun note. I liked that. Um, yeah, that was, that was a good explanation. Yeah. But I, and I didn't mean to get us too far afield. It sounds like they aren't losing a lot of sleep at the Quality Research Institute over like the, the fundamental question that you know would come up in a philosophy 101 class. Um, but I, 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 just, I anticipated that coming up at some point in the comments, <laughs> so I wanted to make sure that we had yeah, at least sure. addressed the point. Uh, I mean, I've, it, kind of like as a rule of thumb, um, we tend to take all of these. Yeah, I mean, philosophy one of my, especially philosophy of mind one on one, and. Uh, where most people would be skeptical that you can do anything with it, we we actually think it's mostly an, an engineering problem <laughs> to to get anywhere for these questions. Good, I think so that's the way you... that scientifically thinking people should be should be oriented. So, <laughs> so how do you do this research? Yes, so uh, there, there's a there's a few components to this. I mean, um, as I mentioned, the uh, I mean, there's definitely just like the foundational aspect of it. So. Um, that involves like pure philosophy of mind. I mean, that's the sort of research that you would do at a philosophy department that, you know, you don't, you don't need a lab for that. And uh, in, in, in that sense, like we, we, we do spend a lot of that in foundational, a lot of time in foundational uh, philosophy of mind. Um, specifically, we explore a lot um, what, we call, what we call qualia formalism. And, and this is the idea that um, consciousness um, it will turn out to be similar to electromagnetism in, in the sense that, um, you know, before there used to be electricity and there used to be lightning and then magnets and uh, compass and all of these disparate phenomena. And nobody had um, any suspicion that actually they were all intimately connected into a unified, unified, um, unified set of equations. Uh, but then eventually, yeah, somebody, Maxwell, figured out that all of these disparate phenomena really are explained as uh, as different regions of a, of a state space pro procured by a set of, of relatively simple equations interacting together. Um, and the same we think is going to happen with consciousness. And um, I mean, in, in that sense, um, we are kind of like very close to other other research labs and uh, philosophy, philosophers like uh, Giulio Tononi, who uh, really take consciousness seriously, but but more so they also try to attack the problems of consciousness with a mathematical foundation uh, where they they actually try to figure out what it, what are the equations that underlie consciousness but so uh, I mean and all of that obviously involves you know reading a lot of articles and books and uh, synthesizing them and uh, seeing seeing how they can be squared with uh, qualia formalism uh, as a philosophy but then there's also the the experimental side so uh, specifically sorry go ahead Real quick, before we get into the experimental side, because I definitely want to hear about that too, but what what do these equations describe? Do you have any any ideas yet? Like, do they describe neurotransmitters or functioning or what? what is the right. mathematics pointing at? That's right, yes. So uh, something like 
IIT, in Integrated Information Theory, uh, developed by um, Giulio, Giulio Tononi, like they, um, what those equations ultimately uh, map to is basically ways of quantifying the ways in which uh, a system's behavior can or cannot be modularized. Uh, by that I mean that um, whether the next state of a given system requires you to take into account the entire system or whether uh, you can basically break down the system into subcomponents and then um, estimate what the next state of each of those subcomponents is going to be and then just aggregate the results. So they, they have a, the math for uh, what they call integrated information. And then they have a metaphysical claim, which is that they associate integrated information with consciousness. Um, I mean, if, if, if you look at, at those equations, equ uh, equ equations, uh, they're like methods for basically taking uh, logical um, propositions and then transforming them into a number that tells you basically how uh, interconnected or how integrated uh, the, the, the logic is. And, and then you also need like a way of transforming a, an actual physical system into logical propositions in order to do this analysis. Um, in, in our case, um, we don't specifically associate uh, integrated information with consciousness, but we, we do admire their work because basically it's, it's some, there are people who actually are taking the, the formalism of consciousness very seriously and, and seeing where that leads to. Um, and in that sense, we resonate very strongly. But in our case, what we're trying to do is transforming a brain states into a data structure in which then you can apply uh, equations to infer how happy or unhappy uh, that particular brain is. And the thing that it refers to is not actually uh, individual brain, uh, sorry, individual neuron activity. Uh, it's, a, it's a higher level phenomena that is called uh, brain connectum harmonics, uh, which um, was uh, basically championed by Selen Antisoy in 2016 in a, in a, na a Nature article, where they figured out a, a way of uh, taking fMRI, um, and diffusion, diffusion te tensor uh, imaging of brains and um, transform that into basically a vector <laughs> that tells you the amplitude of each of the brain harmonics. Um, I don't know, I mean, I, I could get m uh, more into kind of like the details here. I can also just like uh, send the, the link to, to those articles. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, in, I guess to kind of like tie it in with your question, it's um, what this refers to is... Um, the, the amplitude of different brain harmonics, which is basically the, the main electromagnetic resonant modes of, of a brain. So it, it does come down to a, a, a physical property in this, in this case uh, that is uh, pretty measurable and, and is currently being explored uh, clinically. Okay, interesting. Are there, any, are there any easily digestible um, experimental results or predictions that are made by this uh, connect on a specific harmonic wave paradigm yes. perspective? Yes, uh, we, we, we do make uh, the prediction that, uh, I mean, broadly speaking, you will find things such as that if you take MDMA, uh, the brain harmonics that you will experience will be mutually consonant. And uh, I mean, here's where it gets, it, it really starts to sound a little bit kind of like <laughs> new agey. Um, <laughs> and I guess I'm, I'm not super apologetic because, uh, I mean, even though new age paradigms are definitely not very scientific, uh, to the extent that they follow the, the intuition about how things feel, uh, that it can be pretty, pretty insightful or accurate, but like, you know, like this, this hippie notion of you just need, need to find inner harmony or you need to harmonize yourself. Um, and like how, like when, when you have like harmonic sounds in, in music that tends to be, um, that tends to sound good, or at least it tends to produce emotions as opposed to random sounds or, or, uh, or white noise, which is, uh, less emotional in general. So likewise, we suspect that um, your brain normally, you could think of it as kind of a, an orchestra that has all sorts of different instruments. And sometimes the instruments are playing well together and sometimes they're not, um, where each of these instruments would be basically a brain harmonic um, and a brain connecting harmonic. And uh, if you take MDMA, it would be something like basically telling half of the orchestra to, to shut up and then the remaining part of the orchestra to play a very simple tune that is extremely harmonic. And that that's basically what the, what MDMA is doing, but uh, uh, in, in the space of brain harmonics. 
And the prediction then is that MDMA does this to human brains in yes. general, or uh, okay. yes, yes, and yeah. uh, and whether MDMA feels euphoric uh, will will be will be possible to be inferred by applying this um, yeah basically this consonance equation to 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 the set of brain harmonics and um, so like because you you could take MDMA and and uh, you know have a not have a response there's non responders for example so um, of course in if you're an MDMA non responder they they might you know take a blood sample and and uh, and see like higher concentrations of things like serotonin but like that might still not really correlate with your actual mood so like we think like whether the MDMA is actually causing this this rise in mood will be much better predicted by something like whether your brain harmonics are consonant with each other than serotonin concentrations and so you could you could measure if someone's having a good or bad trip yes yes and are, are observing um, harmonics something that you can do? Do you have instruments to do that? Or are these theorized things that you can do or in principle? They, it's something that has been done and there's a few labs that, that have done it. And uh, we, if, we, if we get enough funding, we would love to actually fund a study to do it in one of these labs. Uh, or uh, what's actually most likely is to append our study with a, an ongoing study that also uses MDMA. Um, the, the reason why, why we, we care so much about MDMA in this particular context is that it basically will produce the largest effect sizes. So if the theory has anything going for it, we expect to see it on MDMA, whereas we, we don't necessarily expect to see it with uh, other chemicals or, or other you know, mental phenomena, like you know, hypnotism right. and, and things like that. Freshly baked bread won't induce a reliable, uh, <laughs> obvious jump in, in activity the same way as a as an MDMA hit will. That's right. That's really interesting. I think that brings us right back to the actual uh, experimentation. Yes, yes. Aspect of the question. So yeah, I mean, like right now, um, we are basically doing a lot of low hanging fruit uh, research. A lot of it involves mechanical Turk, uh, and it involves presenting uh, stimuli, basically, I mean, mostly audio and, and visual. Um, although there's also some semantic as, as well. But um, um, with the purpose of, of uh, basically generalizing uh, uh, the theory, uh, music theory that uh, transforms particular um, discrete uh, harmonic sounds. I mean, like when you play several instruments at once, for example, uh, there are well-known equations for how to transform um, the, the, the amplitude of, of notes from different instruments into um, a number that tells you how, how dissonant that sound uh, feels like. Um, but what doesn't exist currently in the literature is a way to transform arbitrary sounds into something that tells you basically how pleasant or unpleasant those sounds are. And uh, that's something that we are, we are investigating. Uh, the reason why, I mean, this is low hanging fruit and it's in a sense, it's not the, the ideal research subject, but it's, a, it's pretty close uh, when it comes to things that are like cheap to experiment on uh, obviously, <laughs> um, no legal problem in, in presenting auditory stimuli to, to people uh, and ask them how they feel about it. Um, but the reason why we, we think this is actually useful uh, for our, our core mission is that the number of uh, pre-processing steps that exist between um, auditory stimuli and actual brain states, uh, brain states is uh, relatively low. Whereas with uh, things like vision, there, there are just like so many pre-processing steps between, you know, how, how your retina is being activated and then how your visual cortex is activated that modulating brain activity based on visual stimuli is not as promising as modulated based on sound. I mean, that's why, you know, like music is uh, the window into the soul, <laughs> so to speak. It, it, it hmm. really produces large effects when it comes to, to uh, emotion, uh, affect response. And... Uh, um, yeah, so like a, a lot of our current like experimental research uh, is involves in basically developing the math for quantifying how pleasant or unpleasant different stimuli are, uh, and this this kind of like ties in with uh, one of our core beliefs, which is uh, valence realism. I mean, this idea that whether an experience is good or bad is uh, it's actually an, an objective matter of fact, just as much as the rest mass of an electron um, or the acceleration of of uh, of the earth right like how 
how much gravity there is. Like there's a matter of fact about it. And, and likewise, we think uh, there's a matter of fact about how pleasant or unpleasant a given brain state is. And sound is a very direct way of modulating brain states. So by analyzing how sounds impact mood, it's a, it's a good proxy for how brain state translates into mood. Interesting. I, okay. The, um, wow. Did you have anything, Stephen? Um, yeah, some of, some of the notes that you've hit kind of echo a lot of what uh, Sam Harris talked about in his book, The Moral Landscape, where, you know, there, I guess, mm, I, I, like I said, I'm getting hung up on some of the ph philosophical bedrock that you're, you're resting this on. Not because I disagree with it. I think it's as self-evident as you seem to think it is. Um, but only because the majority of like the, the disagreements I have with people on philosophy things come from this kind of argument where, um, you know, they, they could say, well, I, eh, I don't even know if it's worth getting into. Maybe I think we, we did a philosophy episode a couple of years ago. And frankly, if you don't know, or if you disagree with the statement that like being shot in the foot is worse than, you know, <laughs> sniffing freshly baked bread again, then we don't really have a lot to talk about. I, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and just skip that one. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Any, anything else that, that you're working on recently or anything coming up that you're excited to share or talk about? Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure. So like one, one of the things that I, I really care about, um, is, uh, I mean, altered states of consciousness again, like for, for all sorts of reasons, we, we, we are not, uh, planning on, on actually giving, you know, <laughs> uh, substances to anybody. Like if we do an experimental, uh, paradigm with, uh, fMRI, we will just basically yeah, append our, our protocol to somebody who, who has the permit to do so. But um, we, we do take uh, trip reports very seriously. And like something that I've been working on for, for a little while uh, now is uh, basically how to help people write much better trip reports so that the, the weird experiences that they had in a sense can actually contribute to science rather than, you know, being like a, a ranty, a rant, ranty Reddit post about th that, that wi you know, wild time you had on LSD and ketamine, but doesn't actually, you know, contribute to science. And um, I think like currently <laughs> trip reports tend to be so bad <laughs> that that helping people do something that, that is useful is, is not that hard. Um, and uh, one of the things that I emphasize is to focus on the what I call the phenomenal character of the experience, what it feels like, as opposed to the intentional content, that is what the, the experience was about. Because people, people get like very caught up in, for example, they, they describe um, like, oh, they saw like a, a, a witch or they saw like, you know, like a, a crazy skeleton or, or they saw a dragon on, on their LSD trip. But, you know, like, that could be produced in so many ways. Like it, maybe you were dreaming or may, maybe you, you were taking a delirant drug or a dissociative. Like there's so many things that can produce the experience of, of looking at a dragon. The thing that is going to be very different from one substance to the next is going to be, Hey, like what did the fur of the dragon feel like? How, how was like the spatial frequency of the patterns? Uh, and specifically things such as how, what kind of like symmetry groups were tessellating uh, the walls of, of the palace that you went to, or um, what, what is like the particular um, frequency of the flickering that you were experiencing in, you know, like the, the, the crazy sky that, that the DMT uh, heat took you to. Um, so there's like a lot of like actual geometric mathematical features of the experience that are pretty noticeable once you, you know what to look for. Uh, but people usually completely miss, uh, they get too caught up in the narrative and they, they forget to take note of the actual character of the experience. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something, uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about. I'm, I mean, I think like, do you have a resource or a link that, you know, we can send people to, to be like, this is the stuff you should look for if you'd like to <laughs> do science with acid. Right, right. Uh, yes, for sure. I'll, I'll send you a link to that. Uh, I just published an article about <laughs> Psychedelic Turk, it basically is a, this is just an idea. It hasn't been implemented, but, uh, but in that article, I, I linked to a bunch of the other, the other, uh, core, core articles about this. Um, I mean, there, there's like some ongoing, really good research efforts, um, kind of like in the wild. I'm, I'm a very big fan of, uh, this Reddit sub community, um, this subreddit called, uh, replications is, uh, R replications because that 
basically it's like a, a lot of people who are like super talented in photoshop and who also take high doses of psychedelics who try to make really good depictions of what their experience uh was like um oh and uh yeah i mean i think like that's super helpful for for science um like really you know like the the differences between dmt and lsd i don't think they're inconsequential i mean i think they, they really will will matter a lot for for the future of consciousness and and trying to really depict them carefully it's very valuable speaking of i mean this is nothing to do with what you were saying really but uh just the word replications uh sparked this this um in my mind uh you you were talking or maybe i read this somewhere you had very interesting things to say on pure replicators versus like team consciousness or whatever that is <laughs> yes that's right so <laughs> That's a, that, I mean, if I have like a, a, a big picture moral framework for like how to make sense of reality, I would say that it's not, I mean, a lot of people think of reality as kind of like the battle between good and evil. Um, you know, there's like more sophisticated people who, especially people who take psychedelics and do meditation, who then think of it in terms of like the balance between good and evil. And they, they say things like, um, you know, being happy all the time is impossible because, you know, the the light implies the dark and you know they, they get caught up in in this kind of like philosophy of accepting both sides um, but when you look at it usually they do so as a mood regulation strategy i mean they're trying to come to terms with their with their suffering and um and to think that it's necessary it's it's a way of dealing with it but you know it's it's not it's not reality like you you do have much better ways to live than others as a uh, um, Sam Harris, uh, as pointed out by Stephen, uh, in, indeed has talk, talked about. Then there's people who are like one level higher. I, I call them the gradients of wisdom, and this involves yeah people like Sam Harris or Shenson Young or Ken Wilber, who basically agree that there are better states of consciousness than others. That there really is such a thing as pointless suffering, like needless suffering. That's, I mean, that's part of reality and we can work to eliminate it. Uh, we don't really lose anything by reducing it. Um, but then there's kind of like this, this, in a sense, like I would say like very sober high level framework for making sense of, of all of morality, which is the, the battle between pure replicators and consciousness and, and pure replicators are basically entities that are really good at making copies of themselves, but they don't care about anything else. So um, when you compare, I mean, a human, for example, usually they do care about making copies of themselves and, you know, sharing their, their genes in the gene pool with uh, having kids and, um, you know, having affairs and uh, like, you know, e even, even like uh, sexual assault can be explained in terms of uh, just, um, a, a very unethical urge to just making copies of, of oneself and uh, but but nonetheless i mean people still care about being happy they care about others being happy they care about not suffering uh too much um so in a sense like humans are not pure replicators i mean like it it so happens that evolution recruited consciousness for information processing but then all of a sudden consciousness was implemented in such a smart way that it it's looking after itself rather than just looking after the, the genes that, that brought it here. And, uh, and I think like that's the, the team I would be rooting for. It would be, hey, like, let's, let's uh, really take consciousness as the, the source of value. And then all of a sudden you see that there's this battle between patterns that are making copies of themselves in a very efficient way and the interests of consciousness, which involve you know, happiness and understanding and intelligence and knowledge um, and uh, agency. And uh, those are the things that, that really matter. But if you kind of like fast forward the evolutionary process, it, 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 it seems like we are probably at a pretty delicate moment in history because there are so, yeah. yeah, there's so many ways in which pure replicators could take over. I mean, like you could, I mean, obviously the, the scenario of uh, nanotechnology, basically uh, the gray goo scenario is kind of like a straightforward case where uh, molecular pure replicators basically transform matter and energy into just copies of themselves. And okay, like that's, as we talked about, that wouldn't be a very valuable state of the world if, if there's like no actual mm -hmm. <laughs> subject of experience and it's just all of these gray goo. Uh, but, but, but it could happen in many other ways. I mean, I, I, I think um, the age of EM of um, Robin Hanson, that he talks about it as 
almost a desirable case uh, he describes it as. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a, a horrible, a horrible case where economic selection pressures pushes basically just people who are willing to be slaves for for their entire lives to be the the bulk of experience in reality so that yeah that, that's a well, how, clear, when how we, do you when we fight against on that, that the... he, he said that he didn't oh, sorry, think that ahead. it was i just wanted to say to be to be fair when we pressed robin on that he didn't say that he thought it was desirable just that he thought it was realistic right right so he, he talked a lot about it not because he wanted it but because he thought it was likely i just i figured i'd yeah. plug that for him that, that's right uh, maybe he was thinks. Yeah, maybe he was feeling like the people that are like, yeah, the evil is necessary as as a part of trying to deal with their suffering. He's like, yep, M's M's are a necessary stage just to deal with the the suffering beforehand. (laughs) But but how do you fight against something like, because they, won't they eventually outcompete you, the people who are willing to make those sacrifices? Um, They they will if there is no pushback, but I think, I mean, there, there is some level of pushback. I mean, like, we and, and I think we can um, increase that level of pushback. I think like a a really core uh, weapon. <laughs> I mean, and and actually, it's not so much weapon because it may be the truth. Um, although it sounds very weird, but I think like a, a really important uh, weapon here is um, personal identity. Basically, um, you know, like a, especially on psychedelic states, but also if you do a lot of meditation or or even if you do a lot of philosophy. Uh, you can go into this state of consciousness where you you feel that um, we're all the same consciousness or like we're all kind of like different facets of, of God. Um, and this, this is definitely very common in uh, mystical traditions and in um, cults. <laughs> but, but also, you know, there, there's a lot of philosophy that uh, justifies the, the view that that it's likely that we are all one consciousness in, although it's, it's a very complex way in, in exactly why how that manifests. But yeah, I mean, if you identify with consciousness and you identify with, in a sense, the the quality of experience, uh, you will recognize that who you will be in, in 10 seconds matters just as much as who somebody, a is, so, somebody else is currently. Um, and if you take that point of view, then uh, there's a reason to, in a sense, try to, to help consciousness as a whole. And if there is a method that basically makes people believe that they are, you know, the, the universal consciousness as opposed to their individual genes, uh, then like that, that method is going to be very useful in the battle between consciousness uh, and, and replicators. And I think like, um, I mean, there's very promising leads for these, for example, 5-MeO DMT, which is a uh, uh, similar to DMT in the sense that it's something that you usually uh, vaporize and, and the experience only lasts five minutes. But what's remarkable about 5-MeO DMT is that it, in about maybe 60% of the cases, it makes people have this weird experience of, quote-unquote, realizing that, that they are God and that everything is God. And they become a lot more altruistic and a lot more interested in helping the environment and helping the world and the long-term future of, of earth once they've had that experience. And I think like really in a sense, standardizing it and, and getting to the point that you have an extremely reliable way of making people feel that we are all one consciousness is going to be perhaps the key weapon against replicators because that will allow us to, yeah, basically not be afraid to modify ourselves. Yep. Go ahead. Hasn't, hasn't religion been trying to do something like that for, you know, since the beginning of religion, though? And I mean, I don't, but then I don't like the, CMT. right, right. <laughs> but I don't like the idea of, of having, having to, you know, convince people that they're actually all the same person. <laughs> I mean, isn't there a, isn't there a more honest way of making people <laughs> be good and helping each other? I'm just picturing something kind of like the Batman Begins plot where Scarecrow puts that fear juice in the public water supply to do that with, with this DMT. Everybody is, is everybody becomes everybody else, and then the world becomes a nice, clean place. Right. If, if, everyone, want, if everyone has any supervillain ambitions, that sounds like the way to go. Yes. Well, I... I I'm kidding. No right, one do of that. Of course, of course. I'm, <laughs> it's a... It, it would be interesting, but... Uh, no, I'm, I'm definitely in favor of, you know, consensual uh, experiences, and... I think the the problem here is that I mean you you can argue philosophy all you want with with a lot of people and they will come to the point where they say like okay your your philosophical case 
for oneness is, is pretty strong, but I don't feel it. And because I don't feel it, I'm not, I can't really act on it. Uh, I will, in a sense, kind of like secretly still just, just want the best for, for my genes. Um, and uh, they can use these kind of experiences as a way of actually setting their own internal emotions in that direction. Um, once they already agreed that this makes sense intellectually. Um, and I think, I think, yeah, that's a very promising way of, of approaching it. Um, likewise, I mean, I, I really, it's kind of like a twin approach because just knowing that everything is one doesn't in itself solve the problems because you could still have that state of consciousness, but be in a state of suffering or have that state of consciousness and, um, and feel despair because, uh, you experience depression or, or, you know, that the hedonic treadmill will make sure that even if everybody's rich, you know, a fraction of people will always be miserable no matter what. So I think like it's, it's the trick is on combining states of consciousness that makes you feel, um, the truth of oneness combined with, uh, or followed by, uh, things like MDMA, like states of consciousness that also show them, show you that there's hyper valuable states. So in a sense, there is, um, like the, the value is to be shared because we're all one, but then there is value and there is, there is something to protect. And that's something that you can only really know once you actually experience it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think like the, 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 the way in which this, this would ultimately play out, it would be in a sense, a battle between people who believe we're all one consciousness and, and, and people who really just identify with their own ethnicity or with their own race or, or their own you know, gender or their own future selves. And, um, yeah, I mean, there's also going to be in a sense like dark magic or, uh, black magic on, on, on the other side, when it comes to, um, making you be really afraid of death, for example, uh, giving you the experience that like, no, you're alone in this universe and separate. And yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think like having, having tools that favor, you identifying with consciousness is, uh, is going, going to be really, really key, really key in here. Do you have any ideas of how to prevent the slide into becoming, um, pure replicators? Because it's not like, you know, we see the pure replicator robots and we can fight them directly. It's more like the individual choices people make every day as to, you know, whether they, uh, like I personally, whether I choose to, um, to suppress my, some of my endeavors so that I can like make money faster, better. So I can in theory be, be more comfortable in the future, but every, every little thing that you sacrifice for that time away from the people that you love pushes you closer to replicator <laughs> and further away from consciousness. Yes. And how, I mean, I, I remember reading that the Amish aren't technically anti-technology uh, in, in, on principle. They just have this uh, ideal where whenever a new pe piece of technology is introduced into the world, they're, I don't know, most learned among them will go and analyze it for months at a time sometimes and, you know, decide, is this technology that will enrich our lives or that will strip us of some of our humanity and compassion? And if they decide the latter, then they ban that technology. And that's why they use some mm. things um, like cement blocks, but not others, uh, like, uh, you know, gasoline motors. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, I want to, I want to see their, I, I want to see their work here. Made the wrong call a few times. <laughs> oh, gosh. I mean, I, I wonder what the work would look like, you know, vaccines or something too, you know, but I could kind of see that's, that's tainting your human experience or whatever, but I want to see the case that allows cinder blocks, but doesn't allow buttons. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, but, yeah but like, so how, yeah. how do we, how do we fight it's, that? No, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is an open problem. I, I should be clear about that. And, uh, I'm, I'm open for, for suggestions. <laughs> it really interests me to, to hear, hear options, but, uh, I mean, yeah, like, uh, it, it, it gets super complicated when you consider game theory and the fact that, um, even if you don't act on a given technology out of uh, ethical caution, um, somebody who has a, you know, lower threshold for, for what they perceive to be dangerous will act on it. And, uh, yeah, like that, all of those dynamics don't, don't seem very hopeful. Um, there, there will probably be like a lot of like extremely powerful technologies in the future. Uh, a lot of them may be consciousness technologies as well. And, uh, not all of them will be pushing in the, 
you know, in the pro consciousness direction and, and people will still be using them if they can for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't, I mean, I think like individual choices obviously matter. I, I think like the, the approach of moralizing people doesn't really work in practice. Um, so I don't, I don't, I'm not very particularly fond of it. I, I think like people changing people's, um, hedonic representations of the world is, is where it would, would be at. I mean, like the, what happens, for example, on, on MDMA that allows you to reconnect with a, with a lover or make peace with yourself has a lot to do with the fact that your inner representation of others. I mean, this kind of like cartoon character that you use in order to, uh, predict and make sense of the inner states of others becomes massively enriched and it also becomes massively enriched with positive emotions. Um, I guess I, I should say that most people don't necessarily realize that the world's world simulation uh, has a hedonic tone, not only in how they feel their bodies or how they feel about their emotions, but also in the objects they represent around. Um, so like when you look at somebody who's very attractive, it's, it's not so much that it's only, you know, like making you feel good by looking at the person, in your body, in your own body, but it's also that the actual shape of the person is completely Im um, embedded with positive hedonic tone, uh, in a sense, kind of like ma materialized visual pleasure. And, um, and I think like, yeah, modulating that, uh, to basically motivate us to, in a sense, whenever we think about our future selves, we think of them as close to us as who we will be in, in the next second or how we represent people uh in the other side of the world that we also think of them just as much as us as 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 who we will be in the next next second so i think like it, it comes to having to in a sense like re-engineer how how our world simulations internal experiences are are created um and yeah i mean like a, a pro-social future where we have one against pure replicators i think will necessarily be implemented with very different experiences uh that right now our experiences are these egocentric, uh, self-centered, um, quasi God experience where, where we basically feel that we are the center of the universe. But yeah, I mean, the experiences of the future, once we transition, hopefully <laughs> into a consciousness focused ethics, we will not actually feel like the center of the universe. We will feel that in a sense, everything around us is, is part of ourselves. It's uh, yeah, very different experience. I think, hmm, I mean, I am, I, I don't want to sound like a jerk or anything, but there are extremely few people in the world who I regard as, as important as me one second from now, right? right? <laughs> like, I, I, I would do a lot in service of keeping me one second from now alive and healthy and such. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, but I think if you were, if you were to modify me so that I feel that same way about everyone who's alive, like, I'm not even sure I would still be me that, it, it, that much I, I i mean i would like to care about other people that much but being being concerned about my own welfare is also kind of part of who i am i mean that's a that's a good point um i would say that there's a way of seeing this where basically that feeling is itself a pure replicator feeling um yeah, yeah. You, you can shed that that core selfishness as, as part of your your central personality in yash Right. No, I mean, I, 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 I'm kidding. I, I'm not. I think. I, I, I think I, there's a uh, lot what, of people in the world that I like, but I just I don't see you know everyone in the world being that. Being no, that no, way. no. I'm I'm giving you a hard time. I think uh, I think what what the case might be here is that there are ways, whether aided through the assistance of drugs or not, to view your relation to other people in less of a you centric way. Um, you know, where helping somebody is like helping yourself. Um, and it's really, I think it's probably easier to feel that way through the influence of drugs like, uh, you know, MDMA or DMT or drugs like Buddhism. Um, but yeah, I, I see what you're saying that if you, and if you modify it away from your current state where you really care about yourself in the future, you might feel less like you. And I think that the, the reply might be, that's kind of the point. Um, I'm not saying I, I agree with that, <laughs> but I think that's what they might say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all exactly. I, uh, that that's exactly right, Stephen. And I mean, it's the same is, uh, when you were three years old, um, I, I definitely know that when I was three years old, uh, I did not care about what, 
would happen the next day, right? I, I, like my entire world consisted of today. And um, <laughs> of course you, you do a lot of reg regrettable decisions when you have that kind of representation <laughs> for, for how the world works. Um, but I think like expanding your sense of self to include who you will be the next year, um, it's a different kind. It's a similar kind of operation as as it's gonna happen um, with these other like consciousness focused uh, states of, states of mind. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, like it, in 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 a sense, like we we are chronically delusional, <laughs> and and we are so because there are some delusions that are evolutionarily advantageous. So I, I mean, I wouldn't blame anybody for for identifying only with themselves or or a preferentially caring about themselves precisely because that's how the world feels like from the inside from those points of view i mean that's um it's it's not one's fault that that one is under the spell of an evolutionarily adaptive delusion well i mean i also feel like that people who are themselves have a much greater ability generally to to improve their lives than i do because i mean for starters i can't physically move their body but uh, being less facetious it's just it's much harder for me to to do something that'll affect someone very far away. So it sort of makes sense to be more concerned with your own local area, uh, starting, I guess, sort of with your body, because that is what you have the most ability to improve. Yes, I mean, that, that, that's, uh, that's very much the case when it comes to kind of like the instrumental value of different moments of experience, different here's and now's. Um, we, we definitely can't affect the past, for example, even though yeah. If we if you if we take physics seriously, the past you know is still there. <laughs> it's uh, mm -hmm. it hasn't disappeared. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean the fact that we can't do anything about it. Uh, I mean, I I would say ideally we should care about it intellectually in the sense of like, hey, let's, um, yeah. you know, if we could go back in time, we should probably try to help uh, and do rescue missions. But um, but yeah. because we can't, we should probably not you know, feel too bad about the things that happened in the past. It's just not, not very instrumentally useful. Okay. We are actually quite a bit over one hour, so I should, we should probably wrap this <laughs> up. Um, <laughs> thank you for talking with us. Is there anything you wanted to, to say, to add at the end here? Uh, mm -hmm. or anything that we really should have gotten into that we didn't? Uh, no, I think, I think, I think we covered a, a lot of ground. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll send you the, yeah, the links for people who want to, to take a closer look at it. So, yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. This is a really fun conversation. Thank you so much. Th thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And uh, maybe we can do it again sometime because it went by pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we have a lot of ground left to cover. That's right. <laughs> All right. Th great. Well, thank thanks again. Cool. Take care. <laughs> All right. Have a good evening. And cut. <laughs> All cut. right. All right. So we just wrapped up with uh, Andres, which was really fun. Um, we did keep talking after, well, basically he had said, and scene or stop or whatever. And so I had stopped recording. He stopped recording. Inyash, being uh, the one with forethought, didn't stop recording. <laughs> Inyash never stopped software. recording. <laughs> <laughs> and the one with software that wouldn't let him stop recording without hanging up. So um, yeah. we got about another 15, 20 minutes worth of, of audio that, all comes through in one uh, like Skype temp 3 recorder, so it's going to sound different. And for that reason, we're not going to mash it into this episode, but we'll put it up for the patron-only uh, content on the Patreon page. Yeah. Yeah. So if you'd like so to hear some more, they talk about uh, things about uh, depression and the God helmet and uh, a few other things. It was, it was also interesting stuff. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think we're just going to dive into the... Um, yeah, we can do some listener feedback if we have the time and energy, but we need to do I, our... I don't uh, think we do, because uh, oh. we have we spent like over an hour with Andres, and then we're going to do the less wrong posts, and I think we should just call it an episode after that. Well, in that, in that case, we do have uh, lots of listener feedback that's getting up on our backlog. I don't think we've done any for the last couple of episodes, so we'll, yeah, we'll jump we'll... through. Bear in mind, we do read absolutely everything, um, but it's rare that we get a chance to respond to it, so thanks for writing stuff in and being active on the subreddit and stuff, but... Not everything has time for, or we don't have time for, we don't have air time for everything, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's go on to our uh, sequences then. Sounds good to me. What are our two posts for today, Nyash? 
our two posts are the proper use of humility and, uh, whoops, I just scrolled past that other one, the modesty argument. Yes. Uh, let's begin with the proper use of humility, since that was chronologically before the other one. Sounds good. Uh, proper use of humility, my take on it was that it was basically a way of saying um, sometimes people try to tell you to shut up because they they don't they think you're getting too big for your uh, britches when you talk about things that threaten their worldview and it's basically a a early a pre counter to that being like look there there's sometimes there there's a difference between scientific humility and social humility and when you try to conflate the two to get people to shut up it's a real dick move and you shouldn't do that it was my take and i'll get into like more specifics in just a sec is how, what did you think about it um, I sort of took it from the other direction, which was less about the. I mean, he, Eliezer covers both, but I, I I took more away from it on the the, the personal side, that the proper use of humility isn't to, um, you know, tell other people to be humble or to signal humility. It's to, and this this is this is this theme is carried forward in the next post too. But it's to actually do what you would do if you were, you know, if you were alone or if you just wanted to be right. Um, yeah. So I kind of, I kind of think about uh, um, the Martian and what Mark Watley does on Mars by himself. You know, he's not signaling his humility to anybody. He just wants to be sure. So he'll double check his math. He'll he'll think through his problems, and uh, he's he's working towards an actual uh, goal there. That since he cares about the outcome, he's going to be properly uh, humble. Yeah, that that's a damn good example. You Boom. rock, dude. <laughs> Uh, right, okay, so uh, I'm going to do a few quotes that I took from out of it. Uh, one of them was, Consider the creationist who says, But who can really know whether evolution is correct? It's just a theory. You should be more humble and open-minded. And then to contrast that with, The engineer who humbly designs fail-safe mechanisms into machinery, even though he's damn sure the machinery won't fail. Uh, which is kind of like what you just brought up with the, the whole um, Mark... God, what was his last name? Watley. Mark Watley on Mars, yeah. And uh, Eliezer goes uh, goes on says to consider the student that says no uh, the studying wouldn't really work for me I'm not one of the smart kids like you one so lowly as myself uh, cannot can hope for no better lot and uh, Eliezer says that this is social modesty not humility it has to do with regulating status in the tribe rather than scientific process. He then uh, compares it to uh, the actual scientific type of humility, where uh, he says that when physicists find a tiny flaw in their in their math, they will they, they don't want their or in their model. Yes, thank you. In their model, they pursue it to the ends of the earth because they don't they aren't okay with it being like mostly correct or almost entirely correct. It has to be perfect all the time. And uh, that that some people might call that arrogant, but it's it's a source of it's a source of strength. He says the end of era in physics does not always announce itself with thunder and trumpets. More often, it begins with what seems like a small small flaw. But because physicists have this arrogant idea that their models should work all the time, not just most of the time, they follow up on flaws. Usually, the small flaw goes away under closer inspection. Rarely, the flaw widens to the point where it blows up the whole theory. But think of the social audacity of trying to be right all the time. And I think, yeah, that's, I mean, socially, that is audacious, right? But scientifically, it's its more of a humility thing. It's a realizing that there's an error here, and I have to go and look into it and correct it if possible, because uh, I'm not perfect, and I shouldn't just assume that my theory is perfect the way it is. If I see something that might be a problem. Yeah, like I mean, if if when you dropped things, they fell at different rates one percent of the time, our current gravity our current theory of gravitation alone wouldn't suffice to explain it. But you know, you throw in like air resistance or whatever, and you can get something that makes a little more sense. But um yeah, I guess for me this was kind of fun to read just because it, it brought back like the easy days of like arguing to people that like science was the right way to go and wasn't being uh I don't know, too aggressive or too high on its bridges. Like it really yeah. earns that, that it really earns those high bridges by, uh, <laughs> or that it really, it really earns the seat on that high horse by how hard it is on itself systematically. Um, yeah. 
I, but, I, yeah, I remember, this, this, this isn't geared towards people who already buy that science makes sense. Right. I, I remember people saying that, you know, the the four horsemen were so such arrogant pricks because they wouldn't. Well, OK, here's here's another quote. When you argue a lot, people look upon you as confrontational. If you repeatedly refuse to compromise, it's even worse. Consider a question of tribal status. Scientists have certainly earned some extra status in exchange for such social, socially useful tools as medicine and cell phones. But this social status does not justify their insistence that only scientific ideas on evolution be taught in public schools. Priests also have high status, after all. Scientists are getting above themselves. They won a little status, and now they think they're chiefs of the whole tribe. They ought to be more humble and compromise a little. <laughs> Which, yeah, yeah. is... is it, it's the wrong sort of humility, and the the line that really made this entire post for me, which uh, I and uh, oh, ah, I see your note that you were about to copy it too, uh, is that he he says the proper use of humility is humility that uh, is useful. Uh, the the line is it may help to look at the actions recommended by a humble line of thinking and ask, does acting this way make you stronger or weaker? And like you said, when when Mark Watley on Mars was was humble about his maybe his math is wrong and tri tri double triple checking all his things, it's because acting that way made him stronger. It made even the the smallest flaw get caught, so he wouldn't die. This is one of the first like real big insights in the in the sequences too, which I guess we're only on post four, but this is just like one of my favorite little examples of. You know, you could sit and argue with your work, your coworkers, or your friends about, you know, what the proper use of humility is and go back and forth, but not content to just, you know, mentally masturbate and then, you know, park that on a page and call it good. Eliezer says, look, how about this? What makes you, does acting this way make you stronger or weaker? And I'm going to just go ahead and say, or rather, I think we can all agree that if it makes you weaker, that's not the proper way to do it. If it is, fine, call it its own thing, call it your own words, whatever, if you're hung up on that. But the point is, is like, the goal of being a rationalist isn't to be weaker, it's to be stronger in every way that you can be. And so, yeah. if, and, and, you know, the, the kid who's like, well, oh no, studying only works for smart kids, it's not going to work for me, you're made weaker by that thought. Yeah. Right? Or if, and, you, and, if, you're, if you're arguing something that, you know, might be important, and then at the end of it you just say, well, of course I could be wrong, and you don't actually change your position at all based on any of the arguments or evidence put on, and it doesn't have any effect. You're like that. That made you weaker. You're just saying, well, I could be wrong, and because you could be wrong, you don't take any of that into account. That's that's a shitty use of humility. That it didn't improve you at all to to say that and to ignore everything that just happened. Right, and he has that too, where um, you know you can meet every counter argument by saying, well, I guess I could be wrong, and not really take the work to analyze your belief, and then having to dutifully genuflected in the direction of modesty and made the required obeisance, you can then go about your way without having changed a thing. And then yeah. you stole my next quote that I was going to put down here too, which was, uh, to be humble is to take specific actions in anticipation of your own errors. To confess your fallibility and then do nothing about it is not humble. It is boasting of your modesty. Yeah. And and exactly one of those things makes you stronger in the sense that, you know, uh, in, I guess, the rationalist sense of more likely to be right or achieve your goals. Um, mm -hmm. And one of them doesn't, right? You know, the, this yeah. bullshit hand wavy thing to, um, you know, knuckle under if somebody's 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 challenging you for being arrogant or something. That's not gonna, that's not useful to even your own goals, right? So yeah. if, if you're doing that, it's a misstep in the dance. It's it's it, even if you're making the step right, you're doing it. Even if you're putting your foot in the right places, you're doing it wrong, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're getting there. And likewise, just saying I could be wrong and not changing anything is also a big mistake. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, that's that's missing the point. If, yeah. if you think you could actually be wrong, you'd make sure you know what that means. Yeah. Yeah. That goes I, to the point of people being like, well, I guess all religions are true, you know, because I could be wrong about this one. And that, that doesn't help anything at all. Actually, right. consider that you might be wrong and how that should affect your actions and your beliefs. I'm if you think Mark that. Watley. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, go on. I was going to say I'm liking this Mark, Mark Watley analogy more and more because it's nicely non-offensive. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could just imagine, you know, he's, he's planning that that uh, that mission or that, that road trip to, uh, uh, I forget the name of the, 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 the probe was that a, to go pick up. Was it Curiosity? I don't remember uh, if it was Curiosity. I don't think so. It was, it was something. But, he, yeah, he takes that 20-day road trip out to go grab it. I could just imagine him saying, you know, 
well, fuck it, I could be wrong, and then nothing, right? Like, that that's so out of character for him that it's laughable. And if, and if he he kind of points his thing kind of northwest. He's like, oh, I could be wrong, but I'll just go in this direction. <laughs> but, yeah, so what what he would do is, I could be wrong. Let me let me go back and look at a map and look at the stars and, you know, draw a fucking line in the sand and, you know, whatever. Um, but the point is, is to if you notice that you if you if the thought occurs to you, I might be wrong here. You you do something about it, whatever is appropriate. And the appropriate thing is never to just ignore it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All righty. On to the modesty argument. Yeah, that works good for me. All right. Did you want to start with this time, or should I again? Um. Yeah. I I guess the only thing um that I'll point in is to keep in mind throughout this one that this kind of strikes me as uh as a good tie into the. I remember that when we were going through the um, Culture War 2.0, like the six proposal proposed. Uh, not solutions, but, you know, positive paths forward, you and I kind of tore them to shreds um, mm -hmm. because I think we were we were thinking about it in the wrong way. We were talking, we were thinking about, hey, I think the point of those was to have them be more personal commitments, not like public ones. If somebody wasn't going to play ball, then they're not playing ball, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing was that we kept imagining arguing with bad faith arguers and people who would do, you know, who, who would uh, make claims like the modesty argument of the same kind of icky flavor that the modesty argument is, um, where they'll 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 challenge what you're saying and kind of demand that you change your opinion, but not really give you a good reason. That's sort of um, the the modesty argument's more uh, in depth than that. It's more you know you should change your opinion not because they don't give you a good reason, but because their belief is a reason. Um, mm -hmm. But to me, that's not a good enough reason, and neither it is to other guysers. So. Um, I just it, it, I wanted to bring it kind of back and tie it into I think that this is a good example of a generalized case of that kind of icky argument that we were uh, imagining encountering when taking those six positive steps to combat the culture war. So that's that was my my one tie into something else. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What I got I guess we should quickly summarize that um, the modesty argument is. Uh, basically, it states that when two or more human beings have common knowledge that they disagree about a s question of simple fact, they should each adjust their probability estimates in the direction of the others. Um, this, When I was reading this, it seemed like this was kind of a um, continuation of an argument that may have been already going on because he mentions Amund's... Uh, is it pronounced? Uh, Augmund's agreement Amen, theorem? I think. Say it. Amen. Amen. Okay, Amen's agreement theorem, which is uh, a Bayesian thing where if two fully rational Bayesian agents meet each other and they have different and they have different um, probabilities assigned to a certain belief, uh, or, or they once they exchange all the information that they have and their priors, then their likely probability hoods should match after that. that They're uh, mathematically obligated to have the same probability estimate afterwards. Yes, that uh, yeah. they literally cannot agree to disagree, um, which I guess may work in, in certain types of uh, machine learning, uh, especially if you can be completely transparent and honest about all your beliefs and where they originated. Uh, I don't think it really applies to humans that much. And I'm not sure that this post really is all that relevant anymore because like i don't know of anyone that accepts the modesty argument uh not personally anyway like no one i know of thinks that like yeah every time i meet uh someone on the opposite end of the political spectrum i should adjust my beliefs slightly towards their point of view and they should adjust their beliefs towards my point of view you know it just that doesn't work that way I think there's something naively Bayesian sounding about somebody comes up to you, especially somebody that you might trust, whatever, and says, hey, I just saw a werewolf. Um, mm -hmm. that, that makes that, that – it sounds intuitive that that ought to increase your, prior, your probability estimate that werewolves exist. And that's sort of the modesty argument, right? Yeah. I don't know if that's – I mean, I don't, I don't know if you find that unimaginable or anything. I don't know if I, if I know anybody who would articulate anything that way either. But I think mm -hmm. that's, that's the – intuitive kind of thing that this is getting at that it um and a right. that this is apparently an actual disagreement that people have had in the past but b it does it sounds somewhat intuitive to me that that could be a way to think about a, a disagreement and you know i guess i've actually heard cases that you know look uh well rather i've heard confusions on how to handle this as patients like look uh too many there, there there are way more christians than there are you um if you're not a christian every one of them should count as evidence 
of belief of the the truth claims of Christianity because so many people believe it. Um, you know, like if you're the only person driving on the wrong side of the road, you're probably driving. You're probably the wrong one, right? I think right. It's, it's that sort of thing. Uh, but this, honestly, this post sort of struck me as the opposite of the proper use of humility, in that I didn't. I found it kind of long-winded and not applicable to me. Um, yeah. Whereas the proper use of humility was was pretty brief and awesome. Um, mm -hmm. So we can get into into it as much as you want, but you know everyone you know can give it a shot. It's not bad. It's just uh, wasn't quite as useful. Yeah, at least not to me. It does quote I, the, the twelve virtues of rationality, which we should probably cover at some point. Um, oh, does it? Oh, it, it 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 quotes them a couple times. Therefore, it is written: Do not believe what you do to others as a favor. If you accept their arguments, the favor is to you. Yeah, I wanted to pull that one out because that was I, I thought that was like the the best part of this post that you pointed out that. A lot of people consider it like a favor to adopt someone else's belief that you're doing them a favor. Uh, it's like an equal compromise, you know. Uh, and Eliezer points out that that that's wrong. Uh, if you adopt someone else's belief, you aren't doing them a favor. You are doing yourself a favor because it means you have judged their belief to be closer to the truth than what your previous belief was, and therefore you are making yourself stronger and your map more accurate by adopting a belief that is more accurate. So you're doing yourself a favor when you uh, when you change your belief. And if you're only doing it for social signaling reasons, then you're, you're not doing anyone a favor at all. You are making your map less accurate and you are making yourself weaker by doing that. So don't do that. Yeah, that, I mean, I don't have anything to add to that other than an agreement noise. I'm nodding from from my house. We're recording in different places since we had a guest, and it's complicated to do it. And yeah. so. Oh, also, um, Stephen is using a new microphone, and uh, let us know if if you know it's okay because uh, it's ha it's one he can walk around with, but we're not sure about the quality of it. Yeah, I was gonna plug that and see if anyone really. I was gonna listen to it myself and kind of just gauge, but if it's oh, tolerable, okay. this mic's pretty good and it's somewhat affordable, so. If it's nice, I'd like to keep using it, but I, I'm already getting the impression I'm not going to... It. I think I sound like I'm on a phone call. Um, okay. It doesn't so, sound good from my end, but, I mean, that might be just because of Skype. I don't know. Part of that Skype. I played back some of my own audio, too, so... But we'll okay. see how it sounds. Um, also yeah. of note, I think that this is uh, this post is the first time he hints at the map territory distinction before he actually lays it out in you know all its glory later on. But he does mention that uh, if I sit in my living room with the curtains drawn and make up five maps that are consistent with each other, but I don't actually walk around the city and make lines on paper that correspond to what I see, then my maps will not be consistent. Then my maps will be consistent, but not accurate. And I was like, oh, look, first shades of the map territory thing that we'll talk about later. That's one of the things that we as rationalists love talking about. Which reminds me, did he, did he uh, coin that or is that just something that he popularized in his stuff? Uh, I believe he said he first read about it in an old science fiction novel called The World of Null A, um, but I think he's the one that like made it popular. We'll give him like the kind of Richard Dawkins with memes credit, where it was a thing that existed, but now it means something more popular and widespread. Yeah. All right, fair enough. Cool. Okay, so that's everything I had. Did you have more on this? Yeah. Um, no. Oh, wait, I guess uh, you have this, this thing down here about the... Uh, the true story of a customer. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> right. I remember this I remember this went around. Um there was a guy who uh had <laughs> had a uh wireless service plan that um it said that it would be point zero two cents per I don't remember, kilobyte? T -t -t Tata was much more expensive back in the day. Uh, and so he called up their customer service before he went to, this was a, a Roman char roaming charge in Europe. And so he called up before he left for his vacation. He's like, I just want to make sure it says here 0 0.02 cents. Are you sure that's 0 0.02 cents and not 0 0.02 dollars? Because 0 0.02 dollars is two cents, which is what I think you mean. Uh, even though the paperwork says 0 0.02 cents and they're like, oh no, 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 we mean 0 0.02 cents. He's like, really? They're like, yeah. And I was like, okay. And uh, then he gets the bill, and it's literally 100 times greater than it should be. And so they were obviously charging him $0.02 cents per kilobyte, or $0.02. And so he called them up. There's a wonderful transcript, because he goes up through, like, four levels of customer service, where every single person cannot grasp the difference between $0.02 and $0.02. Cents. And uh, th there's, there's a quote here 
where he's talking to, I think this is one of the high-level managers, he says, do you recognize that there's a difference between $0.002 and $0.002 cents? And the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which, you know, you no matter, you're, you're just not going to update your belief to, to once you've gone through four people to be like, well, four people say there's no difference between those two, so maybe there isn't any difference. Like, you'd know there's a difference between... Point zero two dollars and point zero two cents. Well, except that this is the case I'm thinking of. This guy won. I I don't remember. Did he um, in the end? I mean, he I must have. He about, had the paperwork, right? I definitely heard about. Yeah, I, I definitely heard about this before. This was only a few years ago, and this guy won his case. Okay, good. So this this is different than you know just talking with one person who refuses to to budge. This is he when because he, he's escalating with different people, and at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you can escalate to lawyers who can actually read. So yeah. Yeah, this was, but this is a a uh, a meditation in patience, maybe. Yeah. I just I can't imagine what that must be like. Like how crazy you would go, because how 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 else do you get through to someone that dollars are not the same as cents? You know, it is bizarre that I mean, I remember there's so, there's only one way to say it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's because I think people don't see like on a gut level as cents as like fractions of dollars. I know that they, I, let me, I think that there's a way to like make that not clear. Like I remember when I went yeah. to Japan, you know, it's, it's sort of bizarre that you can spend uh, $250 on it or 250 yen on a soda. Right. Cause to me it was like $250, but mm -hmm. all they have to keep in mind is they, they don't have hundreds of dollars in their currency. Yeah. They, they the yen is basically a penny, cents. right? Yeah. Yeah. So well, it's like whatever, 90 cents a, a, or what, 90, cents to 100 yen or something but whatever it is it's um it's it's like if i was buying stuff for 250 cents rather than two dollars and fifty cents yeah or 2.5 dollars so maybe it was just the unintuitive leap with the you know the overworked and under underfed and undernourished uh you know uh temps answering the phones at verizon where they're just like <laughs> fuck it man i don't know i don't i've been on the phone for 10 hours i don't, I don't have anything left of me that can do math right now yeah. Just, they, they they look at it, they see point zero zero two and like they don't glance at the units and I don't know, if you ever worked a mind dumbing customer service job, that's exactly what it feels like. So uh, I, I kinda see why he had to fight his way to the top to fix this. Um depending I guess on what time he called. You know, I think maybe your best bet would be calling at like nine in the morning. But I'm curious yeah. if there's uh I wonder I haven't clicked the transcript. Does it say what time the call began? I'm all over it because if it says it's uh it does not say what time the call was. That's okay. I, oh, nope. Good evening. Haha. -ha. My, hey! my prediction's accurate. Yeah. At the end of the day, you don't have anything left in you for math. You do customer service. <laughs> You're lucky if you walk in with it first thing in the morning. Right. Well, I don't have anything else to add to this one unless I think we ought to thank a patron this episode. And uh... Oh, before we do that, let's let people know what the next two will be. Oh, yeah. Next two posts. Yeah. In two weeks' time, we will be doing I Don't Know and A Fable of Science and Politics. And we'll have links to both of those on thebayesianconspiracy.com. Yep. So give those a shot if you want to continue with our read-through of these. It'll only take us, at this rate, like five more years. Um, <laughs> right. So, cool. That's great. Oh, our yes. patron. This week we would like to thank uh, Thustu? Maybe Thusto? I'm not sure exactly. But our patron, Thusto, for helping to bring this episode to all of you guys. Thanks, yeah, Thusto. Thank you so much. And when we do buy new mic and equipment and stuff, that'll become that'll be because of people like you, and uh, we really appreciate it. And you know, like I said, like I say every time, no no pressure to donate. It's it's always nice, and it means a lot. And it is just uh, I don't know, it's something that you know keeps us excited about. You know, I don't know. I I, I ramble every time at this point because it makes me feel uncomfortable <laughs> that people care about enough of this to throw some money at it. But thank you, it does mean a lot. It means so much yeah. that it flusters me. Yeah, one of these days, you know, I want to uh, get some better equipment, maybe even like, you know, some studio equipment to uh, soundproof rooms a bit. Um, oh, but, shit. Uh, well, I mean, you know, we could just do like milk cartons on a stand or something, whatever it is. But, you know, just, okay, just little yeah. things that, you know, would be 50 bucks or whatever. But um, I'm also trying to think of more patron uh, benefits. So, you know, like I said, we're releasing content for this episode. Um, another thing I was thinking was that... Uh, to release the audio for the episode as soon as it's available on patreon.com which full disclosure is often tuesday night um, yes the before the episode <laughs> it'll aired. be only a few hours earlier it's sometimes a few hours earlier but sometimes it might be a few days that's true there has been a few times where we were like four weeks ahead of schedule which was i mean it's rare but it has happened 
one of these days we need to sit back down and get caught up and get yeah. a proper backlog again. But uh, yes, this one's going out in what nine days. So um, once I get the audio from uh, Andres and all that, then I can start editing. But um, anyway, uh, of course you guys won't hear all this one until Thursday or till Wednesday anyway. So um, yes, anyway, we want to do some more patron exclusive stuff. So if you guys can think of anything that uh, if you guys have any suggestions, we're open to those. You can reach us at the subreddit. There's an AMA thread. There'll be a thread for this episode. There's the email address, uh, Asian conspiracy podcast at gmail.com. And there's, um, the website, Asian conspiracy or the Asian conspiracy, right? Yep. Yep. Perfect. It's not podcast. Yeah. Um, cool. well, all right. in that case, I think we're all wrapped up. Yeah. Yeah. All set. Then, uh, I am now at the rambling stage of my evening <laughs> brain juice. So we should just wrap up and call it a night. Cool. I'll see you in a week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye.